It's a new year. The country called Ghana would be run by a government. It's a continuing government in the second term of the, well, the second year of the second term, the Akufado administration. How did it fare in the first year of the second term? And what is the projection for the second year of the second term? On Face to Face, which is the first edition of this year, that is the conversation we are having. My name is Umar Sanda Amado. When we come back, I tell you who my guest is and why he's the best person to answer these questions. Welcome back to Face to Face on City TV. My name is Omaru Sandaman. My guest is a Minister for Information and also Member of Parliament for Fasi Ayyub. Honorable Kojo Ponkroma, you're welcome to Face to Face. Thank you, sir. How are you? I'm okay. How, How is the year starting for you? Uh, it started uh, calmly. I think it's a calm before the storm because uh, we are in a globally difficult time and this year will have its own difficulties. So this is perhaps a calm before the storm. Is it the same difficulties of COVID or there's a different storm that is brewing somewhere that I'm not aware of? Maybe it's as rich of what's here and it's coming to Accra <laughs> side. Well, COVID continues to be a major challenge. I think uh, just this morning I was reading in Turkey, the, the, the currency is depreciated. The lira. Yes, I think by about 20% or so. Inflation uh, has uh, raised its head in Europe, uh, in America. Uh, supply chain constraints are uh, uh, not necessarily resolved uh, across Asia and other parts of the world. So uh, the economic difficulties that uh, have come with this pandemic still are around. Many countries are exploring ways by which they can exit. So it will have its own difficulties. Here in Ghana, in addition to that, you have uh, increasingly worrying security uh, challenges, which uh, I'm afraid the majority of people are not taking too seriously. Um, and between those, you have things like cost of living, etc., that we all have to contend with. So uh, it will come with its own difficulties. Mm. But that's why I say this is probably the calm before the storm. Is, is it time we started factoring COVID in our projections, in our budgets and all of that, considering that it has become like a permanent thing for us? It's, it's in this second year yeah. and counting. Yeah. At least for, for, for us, this 2022 budget is factored, you know, as mitigated um, what... COVID would do um, to our projections for development and growth and how much of a government agenda that we can achieve. Mm. And I think that for uh, businesses, a lot of people in the private sector who I speak to, um, they are also factoring in how much COVID is going to affect their top line or their turnover uh, and how much it's also going to add to some unbudgeted cost items there. Uh, I think it's a good thing for everybody to factor it uh, into uh, they are planning for the year 2022. Okay. Well, let us focus on 2020 in a bit, but let's reflect on 2021. What did the Akufado government say was going to do for Ghanaians in 2021? I mean, by 2021 January, you knew there was COVID. So yeah. maybe the excuses for COVID would have to reduce a bit. But let's look at the projections you made for 2021 and how those materialized or failed. What are some of the highlights? I if mean, someone I think, came from Ecuador and asked you, oh, how yeah, did you yeah. do last year? Obviously. I mean, I think, I think, first of all, we should not uh, keep repeating the expression excuses from COVID because the conversation about COVID is not about excuses. It's a reality hitting all over the world. But that's a side matter. 2021, the very first thing the government wanted to do was to get the economy back on track following this literal slowdown because of COVID. COVID came with a lot of hysteria, and initially, governments all over the world were of the view that a 14-day lockdown would be the answer. And I remember very much here in Ghana where people were screaming, lock us down, lock us down. You recall statements from the Ghana Medical Association and other groups creating the impression that the government was not being responsible if it didn't lock us down. And I recall the government decision that a lockdown without more was not the answer. You needed to, if you would do a lockdown, use it as an opportunity to understand the dynamics of the virus and how it play up. But the consequence of that for all economies that locked down, even for longer times than Ghana, is that growth slowed down. Hardships increased. Poverty increased. Supply chains uh, were constrained. And therefore, the day-to-day -day lives of people, uh, which will bring in incomes to them as individuals, to households, to businesses, and to governments, were all slowed down and constrained. At the same time, costs went up. If you fell sick, you needed to spend more money. If you were quarantining, if you needed to provide some support because the general economic activity wasn't going up, you needed to spend more. So uh, economic difficulties were arrived. So in 2021, the number one objective of government was to get the Ghanaian economy back onto a moving gear without compromising uh, people's health. 
Um, I think looking at how the year ended, it ended way better than how 2020 ended. Uh, it did not end where we would have all preferred looking at the targets, let's say government targets or corporate targets, but it was better than how 2020 uh, ended because we were able to achieve the twin objectives of protecting people's lives, but also ensuring that livelihoods were not unnecessarily constrained. That was one of the major things government was looking at in 2021. Another thing government was looking at in 2021 was to successfully hold back the increasing advance of um, terrorists onto our northern frontiers. And as I've hinted earlier, it is one of the things that really worries many of us in government a lot, that it does not appear that the entire Ghanaian ecosystem has recognized how much of a risk uh, we are facing and uh, has not mainstreamed the response to it. On the government side, you would have noticed, um, I, I mean, I'm sure you paid attention, you have, you'd have noticed a lot of investment into logistics for the security agencies, putting um, what I may loosely call uh, forward operating bases up in the north to ensure that intelligence, personnel, and logistics were available, particularly on the borders and within the relevant communities, and by so doing, ensure that that risk uh, does not materialize in terms of attacks here uh, in the Ghanaian jurisdiction. Uh, we have attained some successes in that area, particularly in the areas of uh, intelligence gathering and intelligence sharing that has enabled us, um, may I say, mitigate what could have otherwise been um, uh, a more difficult year for us security-wise. But there's a lot more that we need to do in that area. Mm -hmm. Also in the year 2021, uh, you would have seen that one of our flagship or two of our flagship programs which I think occupy the top of the perch. Uh, the, 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 the program to ensure that every Ghanaian child gets access to quality, um, affordable education, the Free Senior High School program, ruled out a lot of infrastructure projects in terms of uh, classroom blocks, in terms of dormitory blocks, because you recall that 2019-2020, after we had introduced Free SHS, one of the major gaps showed up very significantly, which was the gap in infrastructure, leading to the conversation of congestion, etc., And that's why a lot of work within that 48-month uh, period, um, you know, was, or that 24-month period, was concentrated on ensuring that we're able to beef up infrastructure. It was something that we think we were able to, um, you know, deliver pretty well. If you put these top three things together, including other infrastructure works, particularly in the area of roads, I think you'll come to the conclusion that some of the top items on government's priority list we were successful in um, containing them. I'll come and ask you which ones you failed to deliver because if there is a success, then there should be a failure somewhere. But let's type a few of the things you've raised. So recovering or making the economy recover was your main focus for last year. For many people, recovering would include commerce, trade, interstate trade. We have reopened the border. We did not close the ports at the harbor or the, the seaports, but we still have the land borders closed. For many, the business that we, we make or we do with Togo is, is something that keeps that part of the country moving. And yet you've locked them down. And Elubo, the same thing is happening. For close to two years now, for a government that wants to have the economy on a recovery footing, that should be something you should be focused on. Why haven't you touched that? Well, we are focused on it. Um, <coughs> we must start off by saying that the borders are not closed to cargo traffic. The borders are closed to human traffic. Of course, and admittedly, cargo traffic will come in with some limited amount of human beings. Um, but what that does is that it helps us to limit the risk of importation of the virus. Now, bear in mind, all of these interventions we are rolling out are supposed to help us mitigate the risk of importation. They will not eliminate it. But they are supposed to help us mitigate. Think, think, think back. It took two cases of COVID in Ghana to get us to the hundreds of thousands where we are now and the number of deaths that we've unfortunately suffered. So any responsible government will start off by working to mitigate the risk of importation. By closing the borders to human traffic and not cargo traffic, we allow as much of commerce that must come and go, and indeed commerce comes and goes between these borders, but we are able to mitigate the natural human traffic that would have also been flowing even without the commerce. Mm -hmm. There is a truth in your question that there are also people who are just traders 
across the borders. And they may not necessarily be coming with a lot of cargo, but as individuals going in and out and doing their business. Carrying on their head. Or... Absolutely. And that is also constrained by this intervention that we have had to introduce. It is an intervention that we are not necessarily happy about. All of these restrictions that we've had to impose are restrictions that we are not necessarily thrilled or delighted in introducing. But the President's words remain true, that we have to protect lives first and then livelihoods. But when, is it we continue, mm, if I just may, mm. we continue to examine what needs to be put in place to allow us to open the land borders. It will require a lot of uh, testing infrastructure along the entire circumference of the Ghanaian borderline um, and a multiplication of what we are doing at Kotoka across all of these points. And it is something that um, the Ghana Health Service and the task force on COVID continues to examine. In fact, this morning at 10 o'clock, we had a meeting, um, virtual and real, I joined virtually, where the question of the borders keeps coming up and the level of preparation that must be completed satisfactorily before we do that keeps coming up. We unfortunately are not at that point where we can confidently say we can have all of this infrastructure in place and open up, but we hope to get there as soon as possible. When you impose a lockdown, is it two weeks or so in, in April or May last year, you said you were imposing that lockdown, and this is what the health experts said, that we want to learn the behavior of the virus the so we can react. Virus, yes. I think if you did the same for the borders, and you lock for two years and you still cannot learn the behavior of the border, I mean the virus to be able to open the border, then it's a bit problematic. No, isn't the two it? are different things. A lockdown, like what we did in Greater Accra and Greater Kumasi, yes. um, during which period people could not move, generally, is different from the closure of the borders. The border towns have not been locked down. People can move in and around Aplao and also in Lume, but what is happening is that the crossing of the border, like somebody entering Ghana through mm -hmm. the airport, is what is uh, uh, precluded currently. Because primarily COVID is getting into the jurisdiction uh, by persons who are traveling in, and then you have what they call community spread following from that. And if we look at the data from across the sub-region, the risk is still very high in some of our neighboring countries. What we need to do is not necessarily to, I think, question the wisdom in the closure of the borders to human traffic, but is to focus a lot more attention on how we can hasten the interventions that will allow us to open So for the people borders. watching us there who want to be able to move into Asigame and do business, what do you say to them? Should they expect the reopening any time soon based I think, on the meetings? I think, I think they should expect that sooner than later, um, those borders will be opened once the infrastructure is put in place to allow... But is that infrastructure being installed currently? Installed, I can't say yes, but the, 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 the various, may I say, types and considerations that um, you know, come with the costs that are acceptable. I mean, even look at what happened at the airport. Mm. There are still complaints today about the cost involved, etc. But when you select a particular option, it comes with cost, which cost will then be passed on to the everyday Ghanaian who is transiting across these mm. borders. All of those considerations uh, are ongoing. My expectation is that sooner than later it will be completed so that our brothers and sisters who need to move across those borders can get across those borders but can also do it safely. There's another argument that by closing the border you are promoting corruption because we are told many of the people who live in the border towns are having to pay bribes and corruption. Uh, well, bribe officials, and this would be immigration officials, customs officials, military personnel, and these are allegations. I cannot independently prove them, but we're told that this is what happens continually. So you may have logged it because you don't want the virus to come in, but the virus but has been intended, riding on Zemiza motorbike in and out every day. I mean, um, if that is true, that will be the unfortunate manifestation of our own tendencies mm. uh, living across these borders uh, to do some of these things, even when the state is trying to protect our mm. uh, very lives. But that will not uh, take away the, 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 the well-grounded intentions mm -hmm. for which this is being done and the need to hasten the efforts to install infrastructure that allows us mm. to uh, open it up. And I think anybody who makes a call on government that hasten the efforts to install that infrastructure will be making a call in the right direction. Let's look at things support. that you may have failed in. And I'll ask you to make concessions or tell me things you, 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 you plan to do but you failed. But let me remind you of one, which is to vaccinate 20, 20 million, million yeah. of, of, of the population, yeah. that, that you failed to do? We did not what meet that from? target. I think before the end of the year, the president in his Forbes interview acknowledged that we will not meet that target, but 
it was a good thing to have such a high target. And it was also a good thing to, based on that target, work so strongly to achieve the numbers that we achieved. I can check the latest numbers by the time this program is airing. Uh, but first of all, the supply chain constraints that I've spoken about still exist, more so even in the area of COVID vaccines, uh, the production of which is limited to just a small assembly of companies. Uh, and there's also been a lot of hoarding by countries that uh, otherwise had the resources to even pay ahead of time uh, when the clinical trials, etc., were ongoing. Uh, but even be that as it may, I think the government of Ghana has done pretty well through diplomatic and other channels to secure uh, millions of those vaccines for us. In fact, in December, um, we were now kicking up the requirement for people to take up the vaccines because we had a good stock of vaccines in town. So 20 million, no, but it was good to have such an uh, audacious target, and that spurred us on to get the stocks that we got in and to achieve the successes we've achieved so far. In this January, there's talk of um, you know, mandatory vaccination before you can access some public uh, entities. I know it's been announced already. It is a subject of consideration even at today's meeting that I'm speaking to you about uh, because we still have a good chunk of vaccines have not expired and we need a lot more people to take it up. It's a demand and supply thing. So supply is very significant. Now we need to collectively work up on demand so that we can achieve that. Are you going to force people to be for. vaccinated or are you going to beg people? Are you going to use a carrot or a stick? I think we should use both. The uh, Public Health Act allows in circumstances like this for mandates of this nature to be introduced. That is what you may call um, a stick. But we should also continue to um, use moral suasion and public education and get people to understand that it is in your own interest mm. and in the interest of your loved ones mm. so that you get... Uh, so let's vaccinated. look at your failures. What, what would you say after you... Okay, so you say you did a retreat after 2021 and then... The president is sitting, you have a mini cabinet or something, and says, Charlie, which ones do we fail in? Which concessions have been made by which sectors? I like the way you put it. So you see, in a mini cabinet, the oath of secrecy applies. Okay, <laughs> let's make it an expanded cabinet. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's I mean, a cabinet, I mean, but things, I get your point. So promises you made to the population that you would say, well, based on ABCD, like the vaccine, for instance, you yeah. admit that you couldn't meet well, But if there are any specifics that you want to draw no, I want, I want, to. No, I want to get a confession. I don't want to put anything to I you. I am happy to highlight the things that we succeeded at. If there are any specifics that you want to draw my attention to. I'll be happy to concede anything that we, we were unable to achieve. You did not do an inflection to say that in 2020. We have, but that's why I told you that for internal purposes we've done that. Um, if there's any is specific, it, is it not, I is don't it, have a is challenge. It, is it not fair to say to the people who you promised that, oh, we said we we're going to do A, B, C, D for you. We managed to do A, B, but we are left with C. It is fair. And so give and us I've given this you year, an example we're going to of, for example, the, the, the vaccination. Which is program. what I proposed. If there are any others, draw my attention. I'll be happy to speak to them. Okay. Does that, is that to mean that you believe you've done 100%? No, we believe that within the constraints of resources, supply chain, global challenges, we've been able to deliver adequately um, you know, to the satisfaction of the average Ghanaian. If there are specifics, I'm happy to take on those specifics. Were you so able to deliver to the hospitals you promised? Yes, we started the Agenda 111 program. How many program. have you built? Well, but the building is not um, an event. It's not a one-day event. Yeah, you gave us a year. I saw, I saw yes, it's uh, supposed to be, what, 12 to 18 months for the completion of civil works, mm -hmm. and then you will have the installation of equipment. It's not even been, what, eight months since well, um, eight work months started. It's a significant period. No, no, in I'm just saying in, that in it's not months. been. So... It is not something that we're expected to have com you know, completed by 31st December. No, that's not the scenario. Uh, I think that, for example, when we get to that timeline and we have not met that timeline, it will be a genuine cause for um, you know, concern uh, for all of us, even in government and um, uh, outside government. Uh, but within, to answer your question, within the constraint of the resources available, global challenges, etc., we believe that we've delivered adequately um, mm. on what was uh, But in, in instances where we are told nothing has been done on the ground, it's difficult to believe that that project will be executed within the period you talk about. Because on that day when you went to, is it Treda? Is Treda, that the name of the yeah. town? And you, you did that. You said that it's supposed to happen simultaneously across the country. But our checks have shown that no, not all the places... I led the press briefing on yes. that. We were very clear. We said that upon commencement... Yes. It's going to take about 12 to 18 months to finish yes. civil works. Good. What it means is that if Treader has commenced, and I just saw videos of Treader, I think about two days ago, mm -hmm. my good friend um, Yamin went there and took some videos, and I saw ongoing works. Mm -hmm. 
I saw ongoing works. Yes, that is one. Now, no, so mm -hmm. for the ones that have commenced, mm -hmm. and I, I'm, I'm sure after today's meeting, too, today's meeting was on health uh, and including Agenda 101, uh, part of the discussion is to update the country on where we are in terms of that project. When we do that update, you will see the progress of work on places where commencement has taken place. Places where commencement has not taken place will also be clear enough to let the country know that okay. the, these contractors have been paid but haven't moved to site or these ones have not been paid at all. So there are places you haven't, that, that has not started yes, yet? Yes, there are places that have not started. Are there many of you? Um, we'll provide all of that no. update when we do that okay. um, update to the country. But there are places where contractors are also on site. And so it is the balance of that update that will help Ghanaians form a certain view okay. whether or not government is serious about this project. But I think on that specific matter, one of the things that we need to get very clearly, even as a government, is to ensure that the resources for the project are available. We cannot afford to have an instance where resources are not made available, which would then make it impossible for the project to take place. The project is not really an engineering challenge. It is actually uh, a financing need. Once the financing is available, the project management um, uh, professionals know how to do this. So okay. we as a government have the responsibility to ensure that funding does not become a challenge for this project. This is Face to Face on the City TV. My guest is the Minister for Information, Kojo Ponkroma. We're having a conversation on 2021 and 2022. When we come back, employment is a key issue. Um, how has that been dealt with and how would it be dealt with? And of course, we'll talk about the rancor in Parliament and how the executive is going to win the legislature over for business to be done. Don't worry. City TV is live on DSTV. Go to channel 363. On Go TV, access City TV on channel 182. On a digital TV, please press the menu button on the remote control and run a new search on your TV. Take note that without an antenna, you cannot access City TV on your television. City TV can be accessed on a free to air digital box like the Go TV and Star Times box. City TV, it's your world. You're welcome back to Face to Face on City TV. My name is Omaru Sandama, and my guest is the Minister for Information, Kojo Opon Nkrumah. Your manifesto for 2016, the one that won your power, was an agenda for job, and you tried to build on that over the past five years. Now, COVID was there. Some companies have to lay of workers, there were other ways of absorbing workers and so on. Virtual became the way of the day, the order of the day and so on. But of course, because you had promised that you're going to deliver jobs, you had to deliver jobs because people would be hungry. Tell us about your 2021 story in terms of employment. Let me expand it a little bit and also put it in context. Because I think, you know, as for numbers, we can throw some numbers and somebody will dispute it and we don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. But let's look at it in a bigger context. Um, for jobs to be created, the theory and the practice shows us that two main things must happen. The um, public sector must have evidence of opening up to accommodate some numbers. And more importantly, the private sector must also be experiencing growth. Whenever you see the economy move from 2% to 4% or 3% to 6%, that means the economy is expanding, and consequent to that expansion is an opening up of the economic space that comes with jobs and incomes for people. That's a general theory and practice. In fact, on the public sector side, you must be wary of a situation where workers are being fellowed or are being laid off. So take 2017 to 2020. I'll give you two basic things. One, nobody can dispute the levels of economic growth between 2017 and 2020. So you saw how we took an economy from, what was it, 3.1, 3.4% and did an average of 7% to it. Even if you are not an economist, it is clear to you that economic activity is picking up this expansion that is mostly coming with private sector jobs. Those numbers, the employment ministry may put it out. There will be a big public debate. I've been in this business for a while, but that is the fact. Number two, you also want to ask yourself, what about the public sector? Are you in a scenario where public sector workers are being fellowed or are being retrenched? So again, look at the evidence. From 2014 to 2016, we had a system where because of fiscal imprudence, 
we had to first go for an IMF bailout, which came with conditions including the non-recruitment of public sector workers except for essential services. So nobody can convince us, because every Ghanaian is available to see the facts, that between 2014 and 2016, you were, for example, seeing tens of thousands of young men and women lining up for jobs in the police service or the military or the prison services. But you notice that post-2017, when the new administration got us out of the IMF program and started the expansion in public sector recruitment, the public sector recruitment is why you are seeing young men and women on the streets lining up, going for body checks. The public sector recruitment is the reason for which you are seeing those who used to go and sleep at the forecourt of the health ministry. And I recall when we came to power in 2017, people at the forecourt of the health ministry asking for clearance to be recruited. Gradually, you are seeing all of those ones come down. So there's evidence. People may dispute it, may have their own shock jock opinions about it, but there's evidence that the public sector is expanding to, 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 to accommodate a lot more Ghanaians. And I get calls literally on a daily basis, Honorable, I've bought forms for immigration and prisons. Can you please speak to somebody? I say, it's a computerized system. I can't help you in that particular area. But that is evidence that today there's an opening up and people are getting That's in. evidence that people also are today, want to get in by force. Absolutely. And tens of ab thousands, like absolutely, you said, Absolutely. But compare it. No. I, there was I'm, a time. I'm, I'm there was sure a time. Want, I'm not, how are you no, going no. to compare? Because the videos of 2021 are yeah. scary. Yeah. The one at the Babayara Sports Stadium. It tells you the pile up. The one at the 37 hour work area. It tells you the pile up of young oh, men. Oh, so you're women. saying that it is the freezing of 2017 that is eventually saying, showing in 2021? I'm saying That's that fantastic. job creation mm. is a continuum. If you have a scenario where. No, there but has we been saw the freeze, people in 2021, not no, 2017, no, no. not 2018, oh, not 2019. You have forgotten that between 2017 and 20. 20 um, we had to, for example, introduce the NAPCO program. Yes. That but sucked in, I'm coming, about 100. Even these recruitments that you are talking about, mm -hmm. it's not up to 20,000. The people you see in, we saw in the videos. It's not up people to 20. People who have lined up like they're going to watch the a football match, in filling the, up the, the, the recruitment the, the in the security services. Yes. It's not up to 20,000. For all check, of them, for military, check for the police, numbers, for immigration. Check the numbers for the financial clearance. Yeah. The recruitments are not up to 20,000. I'm saying. No, I'm not saw, talking about the recruitment. I'm, coming, I'm talking I'm about coming. the I'm applicants. Coming. Yes, I'm coming. I'm mm -hmm. saying that you saw a larger number mm -hmm. between 2017 and 2020 when we opened up NAPCO and were able to absorb 100,000 mm -hmm. in a single day. Of course, when you have done that, unemployment is not zero in this country. So you will still have a certain residual. And of course, there are people who are coming into the bracket. So my argument is this. If you look at it side by side, between 2017 and now, or 2017 and 2020, there has been an improvement in the public sector space to accommodate people. The growth in the economy is clear evidence of improvement in opportunity for people to expand in the private sector and create more jobs. Is it enough? Is it zero? No. Okay, so that's the point. We so have to, yes, but... So the but, Mahama but, but, IMF but, thing, but, but, you, but have the found, foundation, you have found a way of fixing it over found, four years. Yes, Good. but the foundation but must in, be laid. Yeah, but my point if is I that just it, may land on that, yes, the foundation ahead. must mm -hmm. be laid that this is where we are. Do we need to do more? Absolutely, yes. Mm. We need to do a lot more to ensure that the public sector is not over bloated, but it's able to accommodate as much as it can, and that's why you continue. In fact, just, just before Christmas, I received uh, my letter for financial clearance on people to recruit in my sector. Mm -hmm. I do know of other... Prepare, you're going to get a lot of applicants no, after I this mean, interview. Okay. This you is have fact. announced publicly. No, no, this is fact. They'll go through the public service commission processes, mm -hmm. uh, because I think there must be fairness and equity in how these things are done. But my point is this. It also happens across other um, okay. sectors of the economy. Okay. Additionally, you are now seeing growth pick up. If you had a scenario where growth was coming down from, what, 14% in 2011 down to 3.4, mm. that is not a job-creating economy. But a scenario where growth is picked up from 3.4, averaging about 7% and picking up, is a relatively better scenario. Is it enough? No. So what we need to do is to ensure that there's more aggressive growth in the private sector so that a lot more people can get up. So the job-creating economy is the one that showed us horrible or horrifying footage of the conference center where the YEA was holding its job fair. It looked like a rally of a part, political party. And if you add that to the recruitment by the immigration and the other services, and, and I believe they would have recruited just 10% of that population or less, mm -hmm. that is a horrifying scene to, to think that we have so many people out there, employed, unemployed graduates on the street. And this is outside the nurses 
who are asking yes. as recently it shows you the as, size of the problem yeah so yeah. i'm saying that the problem we've already known about it yeah, yeah. you've given us one of the reasons being the imf restrictions but we moved away from those no, restrictions no, no. I've all these years. I've given you two reasons. Yes. I've told you that the IMF restrictions created a I constraint know. in mm -hmm. the public sector. Yes. And the dwindling growth Good. from about 14% to 3% I get even you. created further restrictions in the private Something sector. That, but now, five years. Both, I'm saying now, mm. both have moved forward. So mm. you notice that there's more room in the public sector to be recruiting. And there's even more room in the private sector looking at the performance of the Ghanaian economy. But I also make the point to you that it's not zero. It doesn't mean that 100% it saying, has been see, solved. Okay, so I'm not saying it should are be 100%. Are you saying that all of these people who are getting jobs in the security services, you are not seeing it? No. Did it, I saw the people who came to line yes. up, and I know but that's that based on the official that communication. But the demand... But they were not the picked demand, up. I'm coming. The demand is more than the supply. It's an yeah. equilibrium thing. Yeah. Fancy a situation where you had no supply. Mm -hmm. That demand will still be existent. Today, you have... Supply. Do you have figures of the supply? How much was supplied? I'm, not, I'm not sure. Maybe we didn't plan. Well, well, I mean, I've told that we can fetch those yes. you know, numbers yes. from the employment mm -hmm. ministry. But just take mm -hmm. a minute. Mm -hmm. Take the supply side of the equation and take the scenario where there was no supply. Mm -hmm. Those were the days when you had the Unemployed Graduate Association and all of those ones. Mm -hmm. Where supply, we were told supply. That was just a name. Doesn't mean they are not in existence. Are you telling me that that, that that organized, energized body did not exist? No, there was, just a, there was just a body. No, 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 Sandra, I don't believe you. Are you I suggesting? I don't believe you are saying No, I, I am, and I can explain my point. We all lived in this country. Yes, no, Minister. We all lived in this country. And we, we had saw an Unemployed Graduate Association. Ones, we saw Ghana. those ones existed. I've, I've we have also seen what happened, for example, with the... IMF tabs on mm -hmm. public sector equipment and mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that the evidence is clear today that those things have improved. But I'm also telling, I'm also conceding. You said you wanted a confession. Mm -hmm. I'm also no, don't. You conceding. Said you do it. I'm also conceding to you that it's not 100%. Mm -hmm. Our focus, in my view, respectfully, is not necessarily to, dem to, 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 to deny the reality that we all saw. Mm -hmm. But our focus ought to be on, okay, so how do we multiply this for a lot more people to benefit? And I yes. think that's where we need to put our efforts and our energy. So what I am having a difficulty understanding is, are you suggesting that the sheer numbers we saw on the street shows that you are recruiting them? Well, well I'm not is, sure those people... If, if you were not recruiting, mm -hmm. how will you have those numbers going to a point in search of what? It is because no, you but you are open, asking for five people you and hundred thousand people you show have, up. You have you have asked the question. Let okay, me answer. explain, sir. If you had an administration that asked for zero people, mm -hmm. or said, "I'm not a magician, so I can't give you jobs," mm -hmm. or that the IMF says I should not recruit, on one side, and you have another administration that, even in accordance with your own analogy, said, mm -hmm. "Okay, I've been able to create room for five people." You're telling me that zero is better than five? Okay. So my point is this: the demand, the sheer demand, is obviously higher than the supply. But the supply has significantly improved from where it was in the beginning. Our focus ought not to be on has the supply increased or not. No, our focus has to be on moving forward. How do we ensure that there is enough supply to meet the upcoming demand? We have said, for example, that by 2024, if the current um, demand and supply trends for jobs continue, there will be about 6 million Ghanaians who will be out of school looking for work. Mm -hmm. And it is important to today start exercises to ensure that they are capacitated to be of economic value to themselves and to so others. So that's a very scary figure. And figured. that is why, for mm -hmm. example, in this year's budget, we have introduced a U-Start program. We've made available a billion Ghana CDs, unprecedented in our history, to support an entrepreneurial drive so that the private sector expansion, which for me is the 80% of the 80-20 game, can be hastened. So for me, our focus, our energies, our attention must be on now we've seen it clearly that there's, there's, there's one administration that does comparatively better when it comes to expanding the economy and creating room in the public sector as compared to the other. We don't have to have a debate about it. But how do we even get the administration that is doing well, the MPP administration, to do better okay. than what it has done? I what, think that's what we have to what do. What you are saying now is all, it's very close but not the same as what the president said. Which is? He blamed the former government for the problems of today. The man who headed the last government went to 31st December Revolution, uh, a place that you would not particularly like to remember, but he went there and said that, stop blaming me for everything. I left office five years ago. Why is your, okay, why is the president, not your president, our president, <laughs> still blaming the former president five years on? If you ask me, why is there such a high demand for jobs today? Mm -hmm. I'll have no option than to tell you the truth, that look first to the antecedents. And I've had the opportunity to tell you about the management of the economy, the IMF, the slowdown in private sector expansion, 
and how that culminated in a huge backlog. The interventions we have introduced, 100,000 under NAPCO, public service recruitment, expansion in the private sector of the economy, and still come forward and tell you that, but there's still the need and room to do a lot more. If you want to interpret that as blaming the former administration, I think that that's political categorization for an end in itself. I'm really not excited or interested in that. I'm interested in what do we do to move the dial further? Because now it is obvious that there's, I told you, there's one administration that gets the economy running, that gets the public sector recruiting, and that administration at the same time can even find excess resources to okay. do social protection programs, if I may land. The debate is not about, Mahama says this and Akufuado says no. The debate is now that we are clear that the MPP administration is better at this job, and we are even demanding more of the MPP administration, what are the practical measures that the MPP administration has to achieve more? And that's what I'm telling you that, for example, if you look in this year's budget, there is an unprecedented one billion Ghana cities to support youth enterprise. Instead of having a debate about what Mr. Mahama said uh, in response to the facts, I would rather be interested in having a conversation about, so what is the rollout program for you start? Okay. How do people across the country benefit? How do the first 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 people benefit? I think that's what moves us forward. Okay, if we agree, and it is for that reason that the Mahama government lost the power in 2016, that it was mediocre, and five years into office, you are comparing to this mediocrity. We are not comparing to mediocrity. You asked you me. You are, because you are saying that at you the time, this is what they were no, doing. No, no, you have come no, no, and you no. have. You asked me. But people want to you see. You asked me the cause want, of the problem. If you don't want the answer. No, people want to see you no, fix the and issue. And we are fixing and it. Stop but if you don't want the talk, answer. Talking about if you don't want the answer. No, it's always like comparing no, to your if ex. You don't want people, the answer, people don't want you to be comparing to If you don't want the answer, don't ask the question. If you ask me what is the cause, I have to tell you the fact. If you don't want that answer. No, I'm not asking what the cause. I'm asking how you're fixing the problem. No, no, no. No, if you ask me. But that's not the question. No, my problem. Is that how we have so many people the on the road if you ask have me come to queue how to we are fixing jobs. the problem and you're saying this because if you of an ask IMF me freeze. how we are fixing the problem yes i will go into the details of the u start program you are fixated on what mr mahama said when no, did you say he said I, it no i did not i no, you fixated. raised it's 31st the president, december is the president the man i have not spoken for. about mr mahama i, I haven't spoken either. about his administration in the context of that i am speaking to you about what we are doing in 2022 to create jobs and i've hinted three times the u start program provides an unprecedented one because you asked the question about what do we want to do this for the rest of the year so let's put it aside and move forward you asked me a question the, I've answered. Let me just the U-Start program, program, for example. Let me the give you some quick information before we go to U-Start. You don't want to talk about the U-Start program. U-Start is futuristic. You've, you've hammed, but that you, is where we I should know, be going. I know. We're going to go there now. But you've hammered a lot on NAPCO. Yes. And I just need to give you some information. Yes, that yes, for yes. the past three months, yes. the NAPCO beneficiaries yes. have not been paid their yes. allowances. The 700 cities yes. you said you were going to give yes, to yes, them. Yes, yes. And they are frustrated. Yeah. Initially, you terminated your contract, yes. and then you came with an announcement that yeah, they yeah. should continue. They were not terminated. Well, the contract Initial, naturally no, no. terminated. The yes, the program, program. the program was a three-year program, good. which came to an end. And they were told A to good go. number of them uh, made a very strong argument mm -hmm. that an extension would be good. That extension has been given, and during this new fiscal year, our expectation is that they can also be migrated onto other public sector and private sector entities. It's unfortunate that the three-month uh, delay has been occasioned. But we are optimistic that that can be cleared and they'll be having the opportunity to complete this final extended year that they are in and migrate uh, onto the public and to the private sector schemes. But are you honestly telling me that the previous system where all of these persons were at home is the preferred <laughs> option? What is the use of extending my contract and not paying me for three months and oh, having me chop paid. Christmas you in an empty pocket. You will be paid. When? Let's not get They are in my inbox. They let's are on our get, timeline. They are harassing get, me. No, no. They are saying that they need to be paid. I know, I, I know some of them personally. They are not in my inbox. Yes. I meet some of them personally. Mm -hmm. I speak to them personally. I feel the challenge maybe more or equally like you feel it. But I'm, I'm not saying sure you that feel because you did, they, you did, they didn't celebrate Christmas. I am a you member did. of parliament. Mm -hmm. I have not called personally in my constituency. I meet them. I'm saying that I feel it directly. And I'm saying to you that it is something, it's a challenge that needs to be quickly dealt with. Mm -hmm. And then moving forward, that one year extension in terms of payments, et, uh, et cetera, uh, can be regularized. And then more importantly, the expansion of the economy to accommodate uh, these and other persons can also be okay. Um, okay sure. Let's talk about getting money to run the government, which is what you are planning to do. And you have a lot of ambitious plans you want to roll out this year. You need that little devil called e-levy. The House of Parliament has shut it down. 
What are you going to do as no, a government? No, the House of Parliament hasn't shut it down. Let's not misinform the public. Okay, who shut Parliament, it down? Parliament hasn't shut it down. Parliament oh, really? has not even taken the vote on it. Yes. Let's, I mean, these things that we say, people pick it up and then they go away with it. Uh -huh. Investors listen to it. Okay. And they make investor decisions based on these. So, Sandra, since, let's you're, be, since, since you're going on that, let me let's make the be point fair, before you clarify. Let's be fair with the facts. Yes, so the fact is that the Speaker of Parliament sat and presided over a house that rejected the budget. The House didn't reject the that, budget. The House rejected the, the budget. The House did not reject the budget. The Speaker of Parliament... The Speaker made a pronouncement per incurium. Mm. 137 members of Parliament... I, I you think one Supreme Court judge can go and sit at the Supreme Court without any processes before him and make a pronouncement that he has, he has, he has taken a decision one, on a matter? One High Court judge can. No, he cannot. There's procedure in this country. Yes. There are the High Court civil procedure rules. There are the rules of court. They all apply. Honorable. At the same time, you, no, you see, of some parliament. of these things, no, what you, we no, say, no, we misinform no, the no, public. No, I am not going you to. You are. No. Parliament Let me put this record. never rejected the 2022 budget. The Speaker made a pronouncement per incurium. Parliament properly constituted corrected it. You sat... The Speaker came back. Mm -hmm. The Speaker came back and said he had a proposal. Mm -hmm. You notice that both sides of the divide did not even comment on Mr. Speaker's proposal. Yes, that's what ahead. I was going to say to you. He went ahead. Mm -hmm. So let's not repeat no, this my thing point that is, the my budget point is that, was rejected. No, it was not officially, rejected. The speaker, it was not rejected. Let's move on to the substantive issues. The in speaker... The end, no, in no, the no, end, no, 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 no. See, no, you see, this is... A, when the Speaker returned, yes. he said what happened was an error. You were in the House of Parliament. You was that a Parliament? ruling? Yeah, in, in reference it to... It wasn't no, a ruling. In reference, Mr. Speaker said, Mr. Speaker... He delivered a speech. Well, so how does a speech... I'm saying that. I'm saying that. When he made that statement in the House and said what happened in his absence was an error, but he was going to let it slide. You, Mr. Speaker allows errors to slide? Well, please, he, let's not let's No, not you, you sat the there, you heard what he read. Yes, and, and he I'm said saying that, that you didn't making challenge a proposal. him. Nobody saying, challenged him. The majority so leader, now, the minority that holds, leader. That has no, been reported in that Mr. Speaker's holds. statement, mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker's speech, mm -hmm. is not a ruling. Mm -hmm. Let's be very clear on that. Okay, but when, what is when, it? In fact, he said he was reading communication from the Speaker. Mm -hmm. Check, check, check the hands out of the day. So how relevant is that It's like a statement read on the floor by a member of parliament. It's, it's, it has, carries no weight. It carries the weight of a statement. It is not a ruling. Mm. We have to be very clear about that. If the Supreme Court uh, uh, justices make a statement in passing mm -hmm. or express an opinion on a matter, it does not amount to the ruling of the Supreme Court on a matter. So, Let's be very clear about it. So, and that is why the record must be clear. The budget was not rejected. Okay. Appropriation in the end uh, was passed by the House. One of the revenue measures which amounts to, what, about $7 billion out of $145 billion. Mm -hmm. Check the math. $7 billion out of $145 billion. Very, very insignificant Already on the face of it. Already $138 billion has been approved. Mm. $7 billion of it is yet to be decided on by the House. The last time we attempted to do it, the House dissolved into a very, very, very embarrassing and disappointing spectacle. We in the majority took a decision that it would not be wise to keep going forward, knowing the kind of challenge that we were having. And so we were the view that it's important to suspend until everybody, including Mr. Speaker, was in his seat so that we can proceed with that. Mm -hmm. And that's where we are. We have a budget. We have an appropriations act that has been passed. We have about 138 billion of the inflows secured. The other about 7 billion is what we'll be working on moving forward when Parliament reconvenes. In your plan to impose the hard levy on us, you also compensated us by removing the toll booth. Yeah. The tolls are not generating revenue. Yeah. And yet you're also not getting the e-levy that you were hoping you would get. Yeah. Are we not losing revenue as a result? Revenue losses in this country, if you chose to go into them, uh, are in a wide breath. And every single one of them, somebody can argue, matters. But the revenue question in this country, in my view respectfully, is bigger than are we not losing um, what, mm -hmm. 7 million CDs mm -hmm. from the road tolls. Well, if you add the 7 billion to it, that's no, 7.7. Well, so then you can add all of them. Mm -hmm. The challenge you have in this country is that you are living in a country where legitimately, legitimately Ghanaians are demanding things of their government. Mm -hmm. The government has only two ways of responding to those demands. You either borrow or you raise domestic revenue. We are at a point where our debt-to-GDP ratio is, what, close to about 80% thereabout. 
it is not healthy for us to go further on that front. So do we cut the expectations of the Ghanaian and say, like some president said in times past, I'm not a magician, I don't have any money, I can't do it. Or do we say, how can we respectfully raise some more money from among ourselves so that we can deliver more on that, while at the same time cutting down on excess expenditure or unwarranted expenditure and plugging the loopholes? The government has chosen the latter, that we raise some more revenue while plugging out the excess expenditure and some of the loopholes in the system. Um, the revenue generating measures, since I started following politics from, what was it, the 1990s? In the early 80s. <laughs> no, in the 1990s, mm. have never been an exciting thing for the Ghanaian people. Never. From Kumi Prekun to See, yeah, Prekun. Um, talk, talk, talk time tax from the Kufu administration, mm. you would always find the political class playing the game of hypocrisy where those in power say is the best thing we need at this point in time. And those in opposition say is the worst thing you can do at this point in time. And the moment power switches hands, the people who said it was bad now say it's good, and the people who say it's good now say it's bad. I think that the political class has to stop the hypocrisy when it comes to revenue measures, because we all know that without confronting the revenue question, neither of us can fully develop this country to its full potential. So we've got to stop the hypocrisy when it comes to revenue measures and confront the real issues and tell the Ghanaian people the truth. What we must do is to ensure that when revenues are raised, people are held accountable for it. I have heard people say that this e-levy bill, you know what, ear market usage, say for example that 50% of it is going to the roads fund, label every road that is done um, with e it, e-levy road. E um, and publish, 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 publish on an annual basis mm, mm. a report of all the roads and contractors who have been paid with the e-levy. I mm. think those are brilliant suggestions. Mm, mm, I think mm. those are brilliant suggestions. Okay. But, 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 but for somebody to come and say, no, let's, let's not raise revenue because 1.75% is going to be charged on your um, phone. Yeah, your phone. Mm. I think we are not being honest with the Ghanaian people. If you did mobile money transaction of 3,000 CDs a month, you pay 52 CDs. Mm. Is this what we are saying will collapse the industry and the economy? I'll give you a last example, the talk time tax. Mm -hmm. And I recall, because I was, I was, I was, I was you were keen. You were a host of a morning show I was, at the time. I was keen in journalism at the time. Mm -hmm. They said the industry will collapse. People won't talk again. If you talk, they will tax you. They can, serial callers cannot call into the SMS. You know what happened? The people who said it was a bad idea, when they came to power, they made a law around the talk time tax on how to ring fence it into um, JIDA and NYEP, etc., etc. Where was the integrity in those arguments? Even we, let me be bold enough to say, even we, who made arguments about Kumi Preko in the past, we didn't remove that when we came to you power. And so the political class has to um, uh, stop playing of the Ghanaian people when it comes to revenue measures. Because without confronting it, we are doing, what, 12% of GDP? Mm -hmm. And the countries that we aspire to become, like, they are doing 25%, 30% of GDP. So we have to confront the realities. But... We have to hold people accountable when revenues are raised and put it to the uses. I love this, for. your speech. It's almost close to what the speaker gave in the House, except that the effect is still a statement. Absolutely. But my point is that <laughs> I just wanted to remind you yeah. that there was a time a tax was put on condoms and cutlasses, and you went to town on it. And we I'm removed sure, it when we came to yeah, power. So we removed yeah, it. Yeah, but it's a revenue generation no, measure. we removed so it. Because I'm just trying to remind you yeah, that no, was a generation, we were I'm generating saying. revenue at the time. And we they thought it was a smart to thing to do. We were true to it. Yes. We removed it when we came to yes. power. So maybe they are and also that, is why, that is why I'm saying mm -hmm. that the hypocrisy is what must stop. Because revenue generation is something we must yeah. um, confront. Revenue generation doesn't mean that then you say So that for them, they are seeing people, your tax now as a nuisance tax, as you label the well, SMT. That's what I just wanted to tell you. But, let but, me take a break but, and come But back. I speak to them. Yes, let me and, take a break and, and come and, and I know that there yes. are many of them who concede that this is a necessary revenue measure, not a nuisance one. This is face-to-face -face on City TV. It's not a nuisance show. It's not a nuisance television show. Please keep watching us. I'll be back to wrap up with the Honorable Minister for Information. This is face-to-face. -face. Don't worry. City TV is live on DSTV. Go to channel 363. On Go TV, access City TV on channel 182. On a digital TV, please press the menu button on the remote control and run a new search on your TV.
Take note that without an antenna, you cannot access City TV on your television. City TV can be accessed on a free-to-air digital box like the Go TV and Star Times box. City TV, it's your world. You're welcome back. Since we returned to Constitutional Rule 92, we haven't had a president, you know, finish his term. Um, not all the presidents have finished their terms. So Rawlings finished his term 96-2000. Kufo finished his term 2005-2008. Atta Mills, unfortunately, God made him finish his term earlier than he had planned. John Mahama was truncated short. Oh, he did. He no, finished no. his four years. Who, who finished? Did he not? Four years. He I'm, finished Oh, it. how? That cannot be. No, because the ATS is not a given. No, no. ATS is not a I'm given. I'm referring you to have two a four-year term. Oh, no problem. Let's you have a four-year term. Fine. And he finished it. Okay. I keep telling you to be accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Honorable Minister, you are impugning on no, my... No, no, no. That's my, just on the lighter let side. Let the people know that you are... This is a that is just on the lighter uh -huh, side. Before they take me to town and say that you have... I don't want a repetition of what you did to some journalists. Go ahead. Go ahead. I know you have a pension I withdraw. I for withdraw. attacking people I who withdraw. you used to work with. I withdraw. No problem. <laughs> Akufado is in his last term. Yes. He cannot and will not. And he has said that he will not. He doesn't, he doesn't even to. have to say. Yeah, yeah. He cannot do anything about it. He's yeah. going to go home. Yeah. Is this the stage we call him a lame duck president? I think for those who try to define that to mean a president whose um, possible terms are coming to an end and therefore uh, in whose term the center of gravity of power uh, begins to shift. They are correct. They may say so. Is yeah. that why... He's singing, I don't care, and he wants to shower he's in the air. He's never sung, I don't care. Yeah, I mean, he's never showered in the air. He's planning to shower in the he's air. He's not he doing can't be that. bothered he's about not, anything. You see, this is, this is what you do, and then when I come back at you, you say I'm attacking. Okay, then you can come back. He's not showered in the air. He's not planning to shower in the air. You're planning to buy a new president. Yet, this oh? is a president whose agenda for the second term is quite clear, and he's keen on executing. I've never seen a harder working president even at this age. Are you sure? I'm telling you. Tell me the last president at this age who was so hard working, literally crisscrossing the country on a daily. As I'm speaking to you now, he just landed in Kumasi about 15, 20 minutes ago to attend to business in the Ashanti region um, on behalf of the state. This is not a president who is uh, relaxed that, you know, um, he's won um, a second term and therefore um, Ubia. We saw presidents who in their first term uh, adopted that kind of attitude. But we are at a point, I agree, where uh, the natural attempt to uh, you know, position oneself in a place so that it could be considered as a successor uh, are beginning to show sure. their heads. Mm. The party had to be very strong uh, in the Ashanti Regional Congress preparations to say, no, we are not going to tolerate this. If you don't take it down, we'll take it down for mm. you. And I think we can commend the party for being uh, so bold and so clear in that enterprise. The party which gives birth to the government needs to instill a lot of discipline among particularly senior members of the party because if not checked, it can compromise um, the bigger party agenda. I travel across the country, grassroots of the party are quite clear that they don't want a run cross um, exercise when that time comes. We don't think we are there yet. We've just finished the first year. Uh, we've got about two more years before we get to the consideration. And I think one of the, or the two most important things that will determine who our flag bearer is, is how well this administration performs and how well those who are interested function in their roles. So that you can break the aid. I mean, if this administration is not supported to perform well, nobody cares about your presidential ambition the because then we are all going down. Mm. So you have to be interested in helping us perform well and you have to handle your portfolio well. Akuvado is known to be the legacy man. He wants to leave legacy. So he's left free SHS and so on. In, in his final term, what are some of the key things you know that he's really excited about pushing so that when he leaves, in 20 years, people will say it was Akufado who left this for us? I think I can off the top of my head count about four things. Anytime I talk to him, education is a big deal. The difference between many people is in education. He's keen on that. He's very keen on putting a strong health care system in place. He's keen on getting the Ghanaian economy to a certain level where it will uh, be cruising by building a lot of entrepreneurs through you start uh, uh, 1D1F, etc. And he's also keen on putting Ghana in its rightful place on the West African, African and global landscape. So you see what he's doing with Africa Continental Free Trade Area, with ECOWAS, and with a lot of the international platforms where he tries to put Ghana mm. uh, in its Does right place. Does he not worry about a jostling for his replacement? Does it not give him a headache? Does it not bother him? He's, Especially when people are in his government is, who want to. He is, he's appreciative of um, how it can affect the performance of his government. And I believe he won't be upset if I say this clearly where he has had occasion to speak up about it, uh, you know, at cabinet meetings and say that 
he does not expect anybody to be derailed uh, by that. If you have the view that you cannot function 100% uh, focusing on the job, maybe you should let him know and take a back seat mm. because he wants full attention on the job. Is he going to have a policy where if you want to run for president, you quit his government or he's going to fire them? I can't read his mind on that yet, but he's been very clear that he wants everybody focused on the job. Mm. Is Kojo Pankrumah going to be one of the people jostling for oh, president? Of course, yeah, you'll be MP. <laughs> Village MP. But we know the matter. Oh, please, I beg you. Mama came from Bola. His father from Akrata. Please, please, please. please, please, please. No, good. There are big people in Ila this Liman system. Ila Liman came from Golu. There are big people in this system. I am not part of You have of not reached that level I am not part of them. Let yeah. me sit and chop my small minister like that. I when you chop your president, <laughs> you give me minister of information. I beg you. I beg you. I beg you. Don't lead me to harm's way. Honorable Minister for Information, Kojo Pongro, thank you for speaking Sanda, to happy us. Sanda, happy new year. I appreciate it. This is how we end face-to-face -face, uh, this edition. My name is Umaru Sanda Amadu. Please stay with City TV. It's your world.